The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. It's wonderful because uh, Mary Otis Stevens uh, has been brought to my attention through Gary Van Sand, but also to a dear colleague of mine from Vienna, Leon Lefebvre. And, um, but I would have not thought that we would meet here in person. And Mary Otis Stevens was not in, was only an early female student in architecture at MIT in a time when, um, as I would say until today, the role of female architects has to be um, put under certain, certain lights because it's still very rare that um, female architects have their own practice, not being in, a, in an office, but uh, really develop their own uh, visibility and also a strong position. So um, for multi reasons, we're glad that you're here, that Mary Otis Stevens also is an alumna of MIT. And it's really great to have you here. And Katerina will give now um, a short lecture presentation on the work. And then we have the chance to go downstairs uh, to the archive of MIT where we can see models and drawings of Mary Otis Stevens and also um, the collaborative works they have been doing. And um, we will break into groups in order to accommodate and that you all can see um, the material downstairs because it's basically the research room. So we will divide um, into two groups and the one group stays up here and we talk about the finals next week and if the other group is done, please come up and we talk about the finals again. And I hope we can see the stuff another time. <laughs> so welcome sure. Mary Ottin Stevens, Gary Consent and Katarina. All right. Okay, I'm, I'm going to deal with two microphones today, but we will see if that works. Okay, I tried to put down... Is that actually on? A okay. Okay, I've been working on the archive now for two months, and I tried to pull out the interesting things or the stuff that's <laughs> very interesting to me from the archives. So it's going to be really subjective and just bits and pieces from everywhere. Okay. Yeah. So Mary Otis Stevens and Thomas McNulty were both at MIT educated. And Mary graduated in 56, uh, sorry. And Thomas McNulty actually also taught here. And for a time, they shared an office together were partners in an office, and, but they also had separate programs and projects going on. Okay, these are just some of the publications that they did because to both of them, architectural practice and actual architectural theory were always intertwined. It was always really important to think about the theories when you do a building, but also whenever they wrote an article or in text, it was always about the real life and what was happening out there. So that was very in contact with MIT at that time. Might actually, okay. Um, I just want to go back to MIT. At <coughs> Can you hear me in the back? Okay, all right. I just want to go back to the time when Mary Otis and Thomas McNulty were here at MIT because that was a really influential time at MIT. With, um, I just read in the history of MIT that Pietro Buscelli was here, the dean, and he took a high focus on including practice and theory in the university, not to have the university be totally um, far off the practice, but to include it. And many other people were here working, which is always also has been a big influence, like Buckminster Fuller or Kevin Lynch, which probably all of you know, but also Georgi Kepesh, who actually founded the Center for Advanced Visual Arts. 
and they also collaborated. In 1968, I think, they participated in the Triennale di Milano, and that was a time where both of them probably met a lot of influential people because in 68 you had the Biennale in Venice having all of the very interesting people there. And that led to the foundation of iPress, where both of them tried to give um, to certain books a market here or a voice in America that were not published before, like um, the idealist communist city, which is about, obviously, um, urban design in Russia. And then they started to make their own book, too, or the playing urban games by um, Martin Künzlin and Towards a Non-Oppressive Environment by Alexander Zonis. One of the articles that I liked a lot is the studies for visual community because that's where you can see how the social and the architectural practice um, influence each other. So they looked at the city and had this said that um, since the space between the houses decreases and the arbitrary juxtaposition of family living in a block becomes critical in building, uh, in building up social pressures, neurotic conformity or an excessive urge to, different, to be different are expressions of such press pressures. So that's pointing to something that everybody can experience, especially here when I walk through the city. It's, really, it's sometimes really weird to have these social housing blocks and then look at the windows and see everybody's different or tries to accommodate a certain difference. And they recognize that and they also said that, well, today you've got this certain mobility because if you move into the city, there's, you can just move next to anybody there. They might be from, I don't know, wherever in town. It's just like probably with you with the student housing where you suddenly share a community, share a flat with somebody from Africa or Europe or America, you know? It's just, it's totally mixed, but the housing and the architecture does not provide it. It's just providing a really neutral background that might not accommodate these different needs. So what they actually proposed in that article was to, to think about that when you are dealing on the base of the house of the single flat, to actually accommodate the different needs of public and private. And that would lead to a maximum transparency where it can be used and a maximum privacy where you need it. So I thought that that was a really interesting way to deal with, with it, to already deal with urbanism also being on the scale of, a, of single housing. And I just put this image in because I just found it a short time ago. And again, it's, it's not really about mobility or movement, but in a way it is. It's the center of choice, and they proposed that this center of choice could actually um, give space or actually accommodate 5,000 to 7,000 visitors a day, because it would not, it would not need like, would not have one gate, but several entrances and would work with computers and awarding lines for visitors, and that way everybody could get in there. And another thing is that they would actually take service there and have this as an interface for the inhabitants. Okay, back to the one book that they wrote and published with iPress. And I've got one copy here, but you might just get it at the library. This book deals with very, very many issues, and I just discovered that the issues that this book deals with in a condensed version actually reappear in many of the other articles and text and their architectural practice they have. So, one of the things that this book deals with is the idea of having the family as a basic nucleus. So the family is the background where you grow up, that's 
the way that you are introduced to the society and the way you are experiencing the city and your, your country. So it's really important where you, come back, where you come from. And there have been so many social studies that say that a family might not be that important or we have different family structures nowadays and also in the 60s back when that book was written. But somehow the family was always important and it showed it is this sort of network to a city. And then they hint to this counterculture. So like the rejects of a society or the people that have the families that have a different position, they might actually introduce a totally different network to the same city or to the same social environment. And that starts making or that starts loads of associations, how, how this would change the image. Okay. So, obviously movement is a big deal in that book too. And I always thought that that's a really nice image to have, that you have the, that you can actually pair the mass scale movement with the movement of individuals so that you have, for example, in mass scale movement is the sense of direction that also um, that has the same thing with individual man that has, this, has certain needs and wants. So they also propose that you could study mass scale movement and that mass scale movement actually is a, a sort of language of the society. And if you think back to the 60s, and you just saw the front cover of the book, and that's actually an image from a freedom march in Boston. So in the 60s, you had the students revolt on the streets, and you had so many demonstrations for movement, for freedom, and against the Vietnam War. So this mass movement became really a voice of the people. And that could have been a rather interesting study but I don't think anybody actually did that. Anyway, they also proposed that you could, with this idea of mass scale movement, you could also introduce deflectors that would allay, that would guide movement and could allay points of fears to prevent panics or other, th yeah. <laughs> to allay fears by strategic positioning. And they say that um, rhythm, rhythm in movement is really important and that today, well, today, then, you didn't have the focal points in a society like you had before. So you usually did not have the one king somewhere in this castle and dominating the whole city, but you had this sort of equalitarian um, approach to an urban environment. And that way, mass movement and the equality movement becomes really important. But also, ideas of mass production and rhythm become sort of obvious and, and usable. And that, too, I thought really um, striking, because thinking back to the 60s and also thinking to, to today, you have so many um, application points there. All right. So this is just an image of a model that you can see downstairs later. And I just really liked it because it sort of speaks to me in a way, but I'm not really sure how to express it. But it definitely has something to, be, to do with enclosure and movement and also a certain idea of opening. And actually another chapter in that book was on prisons, and that might be interesting to some, some of you because they propose to have this idea of an open prison and um, integrating the inmates in, in a society, in an urban field. And one of the later projects actually was a pre-release center in Norfolk. So they, actually, they really tried not to have the theory again, but to apply it in practice. Okay. So, movement and hesitations, another chapter in that book, obviously, is, again, pointing to the movements, but it sort of 
equals it with the experience in Arabic bazaars or in old medieval cities where you would have this really directional movement in the street and then suddenly you would ar arrive on this big place of a big piazza where the movement disappears and you have these clusters of activity there and that would be the hesitations. So you would always, it's sort of the image of a stream um, of a river is, is rather obvious to me here. And that leads to the one house, or their own house that they built in Lincoln in Massachusetts, where they actually try to build some of those concepts. So that was this house. And in this house, we have um, many interesting concepts. Those most interesting for me is the idea of the movement in this house. And you can see the, the two levels where you have sort of the central spine in the middle. And that's, that's not really a corridor, but it's sort of the back spine to all the important spaces in that house. And these would be the floor plans. So you have, um, actually that's the, the top floor and that's the bottom floor. And you have with number one, that's the entrance and number five would be the library, which is an enclosed space. And to the right, number seven would be the kitchen and the guest room. And the guest room would be the only one that actually has, is able to be closed off. All the other spaces are don't have boundaries in the way we think of them as being doors and walls, but they have boundaries because the space just, it's like in, in a city where you have boundaries between spaces, but they are not materialized. So you would have the living room and the kids' sleeping quarter and kids' playing quarters, and the parents' quarters are on the, on the top floor, but they all sort of flow into, into each other and are, yeah, as I said, not closed off. So that would be one of those images. To the right, you've got the library, and I actually think we're now in the kitchen and looking into this sort of corridor. And the quote here is, um, I'm obviously don't know anything about shakers, but I found this paper by, from the 70s by a student, an art historian, and she, she was really fascinated by that house and she put that quote in. Quote in. So I thought that's, that's really nice to have. Yeah, and I found in another article by Doris Cole, I found this reference to the derive, which sort of makes a lot of sense. And I always, always liked this idea of having the pa people being passing trains in the night, because as you can see, that those are the stairs up to the top floor, and but there you can see the living room. So it's really it's it's not closed off as being a materialized wall, but it's closed off in another way. And then again, it's always having these windows to these other spaces. So, this house, actually, this house was published extremely often in the end of the 70s and 65 when it was built and then the next couple of years all over the world, everybody knew about it. I found so many letters by people that just said, I love that sofa, sofa. where did you get it? Obviously, <clears throat> since it's got so much coverage in Life magazine and Elle and everywhere, other people wanted to get the same house or a similar concept and one of them was family Riley and they wanted like um, that was the project that they started because they wanted to have a really big house and as you can see that's a sketch but it's sort of got similar ideas you've got the enclosing movement of the two main walls and I really like the sketch in the right bottom because that's you can see the movement that's between the curved walls, but you've got all these hesitations or clusters of activity in between. And then that would be the setting of this house. So 
with the Lincoln House, you had this long trumpet-like shape that opened up to the landscape and had in between on the, I'm probably going to get it wrong, the concave side, no, the convex side, you had the, the living and the Lincoln House sort of enclosed the landscape, so it, it made a gesture around the landscape, but not to the inside of the house. And here it's the exact opposite. You've got the living quarters and all the actions happening inside the curve, inside the main curve. And that was the model. Unfortunately, this building was never constructed. So that's all we have of it. But then came Mr. and Mrs. Torf, and they also wanted a similar house. And they are, Mrs. Torf is collecting art. So she, she was very open-minded too. And yeah, and she started, she actually wrote a letter of what she wanted in this house and what she didn't want to have. And unfortunately I didn't bring a copy, but it's, it's highly impressive. That's a client that exactly knew what she needed and what she wanted. Like how many spaces she needs for clothes and what not. But also she, being an art collector, she, she knew what kind of a building she wanted to have and what kind of spaces, and that was very important to her. So you can see on the, on the bottom that would be the living quarters of the parents, and of course she had a pool. And to the right you had, that's where you came with the cars and that was the garage. So again, this, this building sort of making the curve not to the landscape as the Lincoln House, which was so open, but it's sort of, it's much more enclosed and having all the action inside. So, yeah, downstairs we have, um, I, we don't have the model, but we've got more images of that house and the plan. And then you can see that the inside is really, it's a lot about movement too. And the last concrete house, which is sort of, apparently does not really match the other houses, but is sort of in the same similar spirit, is the Cabot house. And that was, that was a site with a hang, so on the slope. So they, they actually built um, a slab that was parallel to the slope. And from there, all the spaces they can, again, protrude it, protrude it. And also, it doesn't have to occur with linearity. It's got the si a similar idea of having this one gesture of the slab and then having these activity hesitations, as you want to call it, coming from the slab and being like jewels on, on the slab. So yeah. And so much to the talk. I just chose this one image again from the book because it's these are actually growth lines, but I thought it's also demonstrating that you have these people that got joined in a certain point of their lives and then, of course, went on to do other projects on their own or whatnot. So Mary Otis founded the Design Guild later on and kept on working on architecture in a really social scape. And Thomas McNulty went back to teaching in Saudi Arabia, which shows another interest of him. Okay, well, that, that was that.
It was it was on ideas. I mean, concrete was the cheapest thing. I mean, we did that house, our house, and comparative expense was a different would have been, but was would have been more expensive than the brick. Just the loss from brick now is sort of changing over. But concrete was uh, we used the concrete that we used for basement because the color was not standard, which is what I love. And we had a little bin, at, I mean a big bin, at one of the concrete places. And it, it came from a dirt, it had the chalking as a white. Well, and we didn't, um, and, uh, we didn't use the form like the Kofu building, where it was all built out of wood, you know, and then you took it down. Well, we kept putting up the board and then taking it down, the contractor was a uh, classroom. So concrete was sort of in the air. Nobody wanted it. I think that there was more freedom. It was in the 60s. I mean, you know, uh, and, and people wanted to say, well, why not? I mean, I don't think anybody would build the Lincoln House today. I don't know. Maybe I would, but not many times. Because they would say, well, what about your child? I mean, you can't, you, you, you have the, the care. Oh, my God. No. Right. I think you can hear me. Right. Right. Thank you. Whoops. All right. All right. All right. No. prison uh, yes well that was another thing uh, about um, the, the, the idea of uh, punishment uh, we didn't we it's certainly far from what people are doing today as far as punishment the idea the, the idea of, of, of in the 60s there was this feeling you could reclaim people and in uh, the in the world of variation which Kathleen didn't show there was there was a lot on on how do you resolve cultural co conflicts that, uh, without, you know, incarceration and the idea of the prison being a therapeutic community. And in Mexico, actually, that was happening because the families would move into the prison with, the, with, them, with them, the man, it was usually the prisoner, and they would live and they would work. They were, they were restricted. Uh, restrained, just like the people, you know, wearing an ankle bracelet. Uh, to, but they were not, they were not treated like weird creatures that, are, uh, uh, you know, that had to be locked up and and were brutalized. I mean, the way. I mean, the, so and we actually had a, cl a client, uh, uh, a technical development corporation, who uh, 
who was hired by the state, and it was a Republican governor, Frank Sargent, who decided to try to use rehabilitation. And we worked in the prison uh, with the inmates. We designed the furniture for the prison that they could make in their shop, uh, which was a lot of uh, you know flush doors, you know, with the foam rubber. But that's what other people were using anyway. Uh, so it was not. And it was kind of avant-garde, and so uh, they had a strike in one of the prisons, and the only workshops that were working were the ones making the furniture for this pre-release center, because it was to the interest of the inmates. Um, and um, so it was not just theoretical, there was a lot more willingness to experiment. And I want to say that that's what it all was. I mean. The Lincoln House was an experiment. We had no way of knowing what it was going to be like to live in it before we did it. Now everybody would say, "Well, how? Why would you do that?" Well, most people wouldn't do that, but that, um, uh, but that never occurred. I don't think it ever occurred that why not do it. I mean, if it was going to be a good idea, uh, and and also uh, in parts of the world, people were living like that. I went to Tunisia. And there was this Mat Mata, this settlement way out in the desert, and you you actually entered it from above and you went down, and there they were, the same kind of sequence of movement that was in the Lincoln House. And uh, and I was with an architect who was studied here, and we were his host family, and so it was great. And he was so amused. He said, "Well, now you feel like home, don't you?" And I did because. There they were. It was, it was made out of uh, bait. They, they formed the, these curvilinear uh, sequences of, of wonderful spaces away from the sun and the wind, and, and then they coated the, because it didn't rain, there, and it just coated it was kind of like a whitewash. Um, so, and I knew enough about that. I mean, I wasn't just foolhardy. Uh, I don't think I would have wanted my children to be. Harmed. I, I, I didn't. I, I, so that, that was. But it was a question of how could they adapt from living in our narrow New England society into this other. So, but it was a global thing because we actually had friends and we traveled. I mean, I took those kids when they were babies around with. Them. I mean, I wasn't going to leave them at home. Um, and it never, you know, I, I thought it was healthy just to, to live in the world. Bucky Fuller had been a, a family friend and mentor to me, and so of course he wasn't going <laughs> to discourage me because he was, that's how he was living in, in an aeroplane most of the time. Uh, uh, so, uh, but this, so th yes, we were, I think, um, lucky in, in being part of MIT in this world. Which a lot of people think is a little weird. Uh, uh, anyway, what what they what in the guidebook it said the museum was quirky. <coughs> uh, Gary, just so you know that you, <laughs> the write up when <laughs> your museum is uh, so. Uh, but they were they were wonder, wonderful people, um, and and um, and and trying out new things, which I hope you're doing here, too, now, and continuing to do. So um, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I don't think it was um, so unusual as it looks from hindsight. At looking from the other way up, it was quite normal, and our friends didn't think we were crazy, either. I just want to um, add to that, because Mary gave a talk, like, two or three years ago in Vienna at my university. And I got really fascinated because I grew up the same way. My mom actually took away all the doors and we had this, well, it was social housing in Vienna, which means like prefabricated concrete, so no nice architecture, but the concept was the same. So, yeah. Yeah, and, the, and actually, if you, if the way I look at it and have looked at it, if, or, is it, design architecture is really the design of human movement. And we wrote a number of articles that were published in the German, yeah, more in here too, but mainly in Europe. It was more rapport with the kind of thinking we were doing uh, there than here. But I think movement is 
the key of, of is what we experience in life. When we die, then we don't move. But otherwise, we are always moving. And you can have macro or micro scales of movement. And what was interesting about the Lincoln House was it was micro. But it was the same kind of movement that you would move in a city. The same, the same, you, you could almost say that the, that like the street and how you move and what you find and what you see and what options you have not to go this way or that way. You want to, you know, if one of the brothers was having a fight with the other one, they could, they didn't have to see them. They could go the other way. There was always this out, which is very important. I mean, but if you think of, rather than thinking of, of walls or, or, you know, you know, doing the regular kind of space planning, if you just think of movement, I mean, all the sketches, are, um, then eventually the, the spaces will follow. And, and I think th that today this is uh, what you're probably doing. Uh, from what I hear from Katharina, you're involved with movement. And remember Maholi Naj and Jerry Kepish, Maholi Naj from the Bauhaus, his whole thing of movement, and, and Jerry Kepish, how you see things uh, when, you, when you're moving. And if you're walking, you're still seeing things differently. You're not sitting, you're not, you know, like the one point, two points perspective. That is so phony because you're not there except for that one instance and you're somewhere else. So therefore everything is always changing. Is what? It's more disappearing because people are much more fixed in front of computers. Now. Well, that, yes, I mean, yes and, and no, but pretty soon, you know, with the iPods, there's going to be computers. In fact, you, you can actually. So you don't have to be, you probably won't be sitting in front of a computer very much longer. You'll be just taking it out of your pocket. And you'll, just like cell phones, you're moving when you're talking on the cell phone, you'll probably be moving when you're, and you do that with the, with the, with the blackberry, or, you know, with the, you. So I, I think that movement is, we, that's part of our bodies, that's part of our given animal ex, existential situation. Uh, so that, I don't think that will change. But, but the point is that we have many, we experience many rates of change and movement. And the same thing as we age, you know, as from the baby, we have different rates of change. In one year, a, a human life goes from nothing, something like this to walking. Uh, I mean, that's a huge rate of change. And then later it becomes, slows down. But, uh, and how do you express that, you see? And, and, in the, and what was wonderful was what the, the, in the beginning of the 20th century, they got, you know, the futurists, and they all got wowed by speed and, and, the, art, and the Art Deco when they, when they put an old steam tr engine and they put a wonderful uh, metal coating on it and tried to make it look like it was going, you know, flying. And then the airplane. Uh, so motion it, it can be very beautiful. I mean, it, of all, in all kinds. It's just the question of how you design for it at the different scales. And that goes for, you know, visual design too. I mean, it's, it's all part of the same thing. I know, in fact, it, when I was here, we, the visual de design and architecture were much closer to, and, and integrated. In, <laughs> yeah, I know, but, uh, but this is a sad thing because you, they, it, it, I, I think the architects, uh, from what I've seen of the work, um, are lacking. Uh, they, they lack this uh, learning, this, this other side. Whereas Katharina, in her school, I mean, it was like MIT in my time, because they have it. They, they have this fantastic, well, you know it very well, because you were, you're 
well, we're there also in Vienna. And, but uh, like the on thing and theory, you have the theory, you have the visual design, you have the architecture and the structure, all in one building and all inter interfacing, interacting with each other. And uh, in fact, what maybe I, got, I learned more from the visual design ex uh, courses and contacts than I did from the architects because I was, I think that was, uh, the, anyway, I think you learn from everything, but it, it, when, when you start s specializing, that's what's so bad. Uh, and, and I think that's happened in architecture now, that, that, which wasn't there when I was starting. And for example, you get somebody who does hospitals, and that's all they do, and the firm, and if they don't do it, they're not going to survive. Everybody wants a, somebody who is a this or a that, or not somebody who just does what comes along. Like Le Corbusier, I mean, he, he did whatever came along, or <clears throat> Mies, even Mies designed a, what did he design? A, Leon said a, a donut oh, shop or something. Burger drive through Yeah, a drive through Now, nobody ever, of course, he didn't publicize that, but I, <laughs> But that's great, you see, to, and I hope that you all will take on varieties of projects and not just become a specialist that, uh, yeah. But it can also, um, there is a country that will disalarm the museum now, so that we can go off hours, which is a wonderful thing that we can do that. But Mary Bell is also not like uh, this class, they work in eight groups and they make, um, they were some special proposals. Yeah, and the Bauhaus. Remember that, that that was a wonderful example, where they had a, where they had it all together, uh, and they they felt that design was was complete. I mean, and I always feel felt that. I mean, uh, for example, uh, one of the great precedents of that is Central Park with in New York City, where you have Olmsted, who did the fantastic uh, landscape, and then Vokes. And you, you have this integration of the architecture and the, and the natural environment and transitions. I mean, every project that I ever, I ever worked on was that was important. It was how do you, how do you go and, and blend in and go into the world of nature because that's where you start. And, and if you can't relate to nature, the world of nature, you might as well quit. Uh, I mean, because then it's going to become something that's arbitrary and and anti-human. Because that's what we we need. We're trying all our in every way. We're trying to relate to the world, to the world that we're born into, to the site, to the to the spaces, to the people, you know, to to th that. And and that's what our designers, whether they're architects or sculptors or graphic designers or whatever. Uh, that's what they, that's what our role is. If we can't do that for people, we better just not do it. And it's not to, it's not these arbitrary forms that, uh, uh, that people may, I mean, going, I believe in going, you have to go from the inside out. Uh, and then, and then what the building looks like at the end is part of that process. It's not, ah, uh -huh, oh, look. I mean, this idea, I know Frank Gehry, this thing, you know, crumple up the paper, throw it on the floor and say, oh, good. I mean, that is so superficial in, pro the, 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 the process is so superficial that the product turns out to be, in most cases, that. Um, and so, it, when, it, when at MIT here, when I was around, no matter what, if you were a chemist or a, Whatever uh, discipline you were in, you had it was it was process oriented, and that's what that museum shows you. If you go through it, uh, you, you'll see the, all the Edgerton and all these people. Everything is the process, and you, so you, your process results in what it is, and and that's a real scientific attitude.
but right. then an architecture that would work with roof rent. I think it's very interesting to, to support exactly the process rather than like putting limits yeah, to right. stop the process. And I think we get so much determined by the spaces like we work in, we live in, it conditions us so much. So I think to, to work with uh, the process, also with what is supposed to happen, Right. It's interesting, but it's a complete like reverse way of planning. Yes, I know that. I, I think the planning is lamentable. I mean, you. I mean, the planned environments are often very oppressive. That was the point of of Alexander Zonis's book towards a non-oppressive environment. Is that we? If, if, where do you like to go in Boston? Like the North End, the South End, where you walk and meander. Uh, the deadliest place is Government Center, which was the most planned place uh, uh, of all. I mean, planned places, because they are so arbitrary, and they're not designed, the movement is just, it's just putting blocks down. You know how they, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bad process. Uh, uh, I think it's, uh, so that's what I hope that all of you will do, is kind of, for the architects, show them a better process, and then we'll get better products. So what we will do now, do you have a question? Yeah, I did again. Um, you were talking before about how the process is concerned, and you speak to it very fondly. I was wondering, how do you feel, how successful did you feel it was for some of the ideals that you were just discussing now? That what? You know, how you lived in it and sort of worked with it. Yeah. Yes, what, what do I feel about it now? That it was an experiment that um, I, I'm glad we did, although um, I think it was harder on my children than I th knew at the time because the people in the town were so, many of them, resist, resented it being there. And, uh, I, and, you know, when children are little, they don't tell you things that really bother them often. You don't you find that out later. But um, I just remember uh, once going to a parent conference, you know, I mean, it, with the school, and one of my children was having, had, uh, had reading problems and dyslexia. And well, anyway, the teacher said, well, if I lived in that house, I'd have problems too. <laughs> so that, uh, so you see, that, that kind of, um, what my kids were in that environment, you see, where I was out working, I didn't see it. Uh, and so what they've told me later, uh, I mean, they loved growing up there. Uh, and the other thing that um, was, uh, because it was in a sense I, an ideal, it was an ideal life for them, for us. I mean, we, it was beautiful space, a beautiful environment, but then, and then they felt very free, they could, they, they could lie down, they, they, one of them used to just fall asleep under the glass table in the living room, and then I'd just pick him up and bring him to his bed later, and he outgrew it, but if he wanted, they could come and go, and I remember this Israeli architect who had grown up on a kibbutz came by, and he, told me, and at the time I couldn't believe it, but I remembered, he said, you know, it's going to be very hard on your children when they leave here, because he had found the same thing when he had left, because you have this communal life, and then you leave it, and you go into a society which is not communal, I mean, it, it, we're very individualistic, there's very kind of competitive, my three sons are very, very close to each other and, and, the, and the children and their children. So we still live like the same way, even though we're not living in the Lincoln House. We still live in, this, we live in Cambridge, different parts. And I'm very much of a hands-on grandmother. Um, but I, I, know, I know it's pain, but, you, but the other thing is, what well, should, then I have gotten a garrison co colonial and put them there and made them, you know, I wasn't going to do that. So to the argument that you're, you're subjecting your children to uh, 
a certain amount of stress by doing something like that. You're subjecting your children to a certain amount of stress if you don't do that. So you, you've, got, you've got to figure out um, which way you want to go. And also remember that children always are going to go the opposite way of their parents. Uh, so that, that's, that's rule number one. Um, uh, so that, as I would say, yes, I'm glad, because not just for, my, um, uh, for us, because we didn't, I, I mean, it was really done as an experiment in the way of believing. I wanted to, I have a strong belief of serving our society, which I come from an old family, and that's what, you know, from the very beginning, the people believe that you, you do something for your, the, the democracy. That, um, and so it was, that's what I did. <laughs> I mean, I felt, well, if this is built, this, and we live in it, and people see how we live in it, maybe they'll live a little differently. But I don't know if it, that happened, but that was the motivation, one of the motivations. What's happened to the house? It got torn down. Yeah, then to, yeah, well, what happened to it was that uh, after we sold it to um, an interim thing, and Sarah Caldwell, who was the director of the opera company, she was she was a very creative artist, but she, her, her opera company went down the tubes and she got, she had to sell the house. And she didn't take very good care of it, it was in terrible shape. And then uh, the property, Lincoln became very, very desirable to live in. And it was, and it was a very nice site. So some very rich guy who, I got a hundred million dollars in one of these, you know, companies on Route 28. Um, he bought, he bought not only the Lincoln House, he bought the house, the property next door, and he tore them both down. And he, what he built, with, that was uh, uh, not seeing it go down was. I mean, I didn't actually see it, but I almost did. Uh, the 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 fact of 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 the that you don't have you didn't they changed the rules now you have to have a demolition permit but at that time in about i think it was uh, 2000 uh you didn't you could just tear anything down now you have to get a demolition permit uh but anyway he he just he used two realtors and he, he and he told sarah call while he was going to restore the house and make it a he used it for his study, and he was going to build a bigger house for himself and his family. And uh, so she uh, bought, she, she went for it. I mean, I had an, an agreement with her that if she couldn't sell it, uh, uh, I mean, that at, at a teardown price or whatever, that then I would, you know, that we would really try to save it. Uh, by doing what we could. But the, the Gropius house in Lincoln, that would have gone down too, except for the Spinea, that run, that took it over. Because the people who live in Lincoln now are not the same people. They're, 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 they're very materialistic, they're very conventional, and they don't, and, and they, and that man, oh yeah, our neighbor, on one side, I called him up, uh, I said, George, well, what do you think of the of the house uh, being torn down? He said, well, I, I don't like it very much, but he said, uh, it could have been worse. And I said, well, what could be worse? He said, well, there was some fellow around who wanted to make it into a museum, a, uh, kind of a sculpture gallery, which would have meant changing the, ver uh, the zoning, and that would, and he said, I didn't want any Dirk Hort over in my backyard. He actually said those words. So that was the tone of Lincoln. So when you do something, uh, you have to be prepared that you're, you know, it's not going to be popular and that the will, or it will change. You have to take your risks. 